I remember several years ago listening to a young man who said he was telling me that he was going to be a missionary, uh, that he was going to b go to Nepal and be involved in church planting there. And as it turns out, he never did. He never made it there. And the reason is he had these intentions, but he never took the steps that put him on the path toward the goal he wanted to be at, to where he wanted to, where he wanted to go. So uh, training then takes, means making the decision that are going, that's going to help us accomplish those goals. Time and effort are a requirement. But in addition to time and effort, we know that if we're going to, to rid ourselves of, um, say, spiritual flab and be hard-body Christians, we need to want to do so. And this is, this is where I think the rub comes. Many of us have good intentions about being good, in, being good Christians. But when it comes to making the effort and in, in uh, establishing the disciplines and the practices that are involved in becoming a hard-body Christian. What do I mean by hard-body? I mean it's just somebody who can, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll hear more about this later on, but it's somebody who can stand the tests against their faith and continue on. So without desire, it just becomes unbearable to deny ourselves. I, I, I told you last week about this series of, of um, uh, the Discovery Channel uh, TV presentations called Surviving the Cut. So all this week, since I had time, I, I, uh, my wife doesn't like to watch these because our son is in special forces, and so she just doesn't want to know what's going on. So I, I particularly like it. But uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's one on special forces combat, drive, uh, combat divers. Uh, drivers are for Taiwan, uh, combat drivers. But... Uh, <laughs> They have a special course for that in Taiwan. <clears throat> but they had, to, they had to spend 13 hours learning how, learning the drill of how to put their gear on and get it in running order within 10 minutes. And the whole team had to complete the process within 10 minutes. It took them 13 hours to where they could flawlessly and thoughtlessly put on the, the, the equipment and get it ready to go uh, just, um, just as a response. The reason is because they were to get into the water, and for 30 minutes, they would have masks that were blinded so they couldn't see anything. They weren't allowed to touch the bottom, and there were their trainers who were to, who were to crush into them, turn them all around, grab their breathing apparatus, and just cause all kinds of disarray. And every time that happened, they had to have the presence of mind underwater, whether you had taken a breath or not, to be able to put all your gear back in order and to get breathing again. I mean, this is just time. And, and as soon as you get it back and you get a couple breaths, wham, they smack you again. And, uh, and, and, and the, the chaos begins. It's like it's, it's to reproduce being in a, a crushing surf. And if you've been in a crushing surf and it's taken, you're just going round and round and round. You're just dying for some breath and you don't know which way is even up. Uh, that's what they're trying to do. Well, one of the soldiers said, I can't do this. He quit because, he says, I don't have the level of commitment to endure and overcome a constant state of panic. And so he said, you know, if I can't do this here, this is the second day of training, I'm just not cut out for it. So he walked off. And their whole, uh, their whole purpose of this training is to develop within these soldiers an automatic response, a tendency to where without even thinking whatever situation they might find themselves, they know the process to go through to get back to a place where they can be breathing and normal again. The disciples of Jesus Christ were also tested. They were tested with a very traumatic event. For three years, they had walked with Jesus. He was their Messiah. For three years, they had interacted with him. He had, he had taught them. He had nurtured them. He had cared for them. And then he was gone. They saw as he was crucified on the cross. They were blind, blindsided by this, this fear and this grief that suddenly enveloped their life. They locked themselves within the doors. But you see, Jesus came to them. 
And Jesus says, I give you my spirit. He breathed on them his spirit so that his presence would always be with them and always be with us. And then he sent them out to be conquerors to conquer the world. So desire is so important. Desire to be like Jesus. It's, it's essential to practicing and maintaining disciplines needed for spiritual fitness. Now, in this morning's scripture, which, by the way, in your bulletin is wrong. Instead of being Luke 4, it should be Luke 6, 46 to 49. Luke 6, 46 to 49. And the context of this sermon goes back to the whole chapter of uh, Luke 6, beginning back in verse 12, actually, when Jesus begins to, to um, teach those, that large group of disciples that has uh, followed him. So, in, in your mind, think about it like this. Picture going on to a playground where children are randomly kicking a ball around and chasing after it. Think about then choosing 11 of those children and taking them somewhere else to train them to be serious football players in serious competition. I, uh, this past week, I had a chance to referee uh, at, at the Kweishan School here, and they had the, the lower kids, fourth and fifth grade, and then they had sixth, seventh, and eighth grade kids in two different leagues, as it were, teaching them how to play soccer. It's really very, very well run, but I'll tell you what. Uh, those little kids, those fourth and fifth graders, they ran circles around the older kids. The older kids, I was roughing them, and this was so boring. They're just kind of sitting there, you know, like. But the, the little kids, there were some good ball players, and, and man, it was, it was fun watching them. And it would be fun being their coach and seeing them as they then began to develop the skills. It's interesting, too, that in this process, they, they had a class, which was about 10 minutes long, in which they lectured about the game and told about the rules, but then they sent them out for drills, and then they also put them into a game situation. You see, lecturing for hours and hours about the finer points of the game is not going to produce good players. You've got to get in the game. You've got to learn the, the tendencies, and you've got to do the drills so that you, you know the game and know what to do at the right time. And so, this is what Jesus does, teaching simple things. He, in this passage of Scripture, earlier on in chapter 12, he says, uh, gives about four or five things that you need to do, and then he says about four things, woe unto them, and, and tells them not to do them. Now, what Jesus is doing is this. He has come, as it were, out into the playground where all sorts of people are trying out ways of being God's people. From the people then he has met, he chooses 12 of them. And he calls, in the early part of, of Luke chapter 6, he calls out these 12 men. From the people he has met, he chooses 12. He gives them very clear orders how his vision of God's work is going to go forward. He gives four promises, four warnings, presents them in terms of, uh, of, uh, of how these Israelites are going to understand them. And now with this renewed Israel formed around him, Jesus gives them his own version of how he wants the world to be. So, Jesus then begins this training session. And what the passage of Scripture I'd like for us to read today is how he closes the training session with a series of questions, particularly having to do, beginning with verse 46. Let's read that passage. He says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? It's interesting that this story that Jesus tells, it has a promise. He says, if you hear my words and you do them, your house will be strong. In fact, is, he says it will be unshakable. So to build a strong home, a strong house, it needs to be established on a rock. 
the storms will come, the waters will rise up, and then he says the flood will smash against the house, but it will not shake. Why? There's been proper preparation made. There's been proper uh, uh, work put into digging a foundation, founding it on the rock, and then building upon that. Jesus is, is like a coach. He's, he's forming a team. There's a whole lot of people out there who some might be uh, uh, curious, who are just wanting to see what's going on. And there may be some of you who are here today. You've, you've heard about Grace Church, and you've heard about what's going on. You're just kind of curious. You'd like to know, well, you know, I want to see what's happening here. I want to know about this, uh, this Jesus guy. They're just wanting to see how things go. They're curious. We talked about this last week about the considerable crowd that's there. They're the ones who are convinced. The vast majority of believers would be ones who have said, you know, I'm convinced of who Jesus is. And when we read, uh, beginning in verse 17, if you read, it talks about people who, uh, have, who, who are coming, and they come to Jesus for the purpose of being healed. They know if they go to Jesus and they, are, and they are touched by him, they can be healed. Therefore, they seek then to find him. They seek to follow him because they are convinced of his ability. Then there's the committed. Jesus and the disciples he's called unto him for now, suggesting companionship. They're identifying with and being shaped in relationship to his life and his mission. They're the committed, the convinced, and then the curious. So amongst these people, Jesus is calling out his crowd. He calls to everyone. And then like a coach, he begins to tell them if they will follow him, if they'll learn from him, and they'll execute his instructions, they will win. Everybody likes to win, right? One of the winningest, if not the winningest coach of all time is named John Wooden. Amazing guy. Uh, he, and I don't want to go into his whole biography now, except to know that the, he, he was a good athlete himself, but not only that, he was a very wise man. He, uh, his... Um, Winnings, his, the, his entire life's winning was over 81%. That's pretty huge. Very few people will win uh, over three-quarters of their games. 81% of his, of his uh, lifetime winning. Also, <clears throat> John Wooden coached the uh, UCLA Bruins for 27 years. Winning in, ten, in 12 years, he won 10 NCAA titles a record that has never, no one has even come close. He had two teams at UCLA that went 30-0, and 0, two perfect seasons. He, uh, <laughs> he won, <clears throat> and his teams, eight consecutive games where he did not lose. Uh, that's incredible. That's a record that is uh, likely to never, ever be broken. Of course, who knows? Um, on his home court, in his entire winning, in his entire career at UCLA, he only lost two games on his home court. Uh, how fantastic is that? The guy's an amazing coach, but more than that, if you ask him, uh, which they did, what did he consider his greatest accomplishments in life? He said that my players would continue on and be successful in life. If you go online and, and, and Google John Wooden's quotes. He has a whole book of quotes that uh, people have learned from him and passed on. And uh, quotes that uh, are very, very much um, geared to very practical things. A practical man who is concerned even about details. You might remember a basketball player by the name of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Uh, probably one of the greatest basketball players to ever play the game. His name at first was Lou Alcindor, when he, at least when he went to UCLA. But the, um, he was interviewed about his experience with Coach Wooden. He says this, The first day that you go to play for Coach, Coach Wooden, he tells you about how to put your socks on. Now, we're talking about college basketball players, first day of practice, how to put your socks on. 
The reason he does that is because his system requires that you do everything on the run. You don't jog through things. You have to run full speed. The wear and tear on your feet is immediate and intense. And if your socks aren't on right, if you have like a ridge that you're running over in your sock, you're going to get a blister. Then you won't be able to practice. If you don't practice for Coach Wooden, you don't play. So he was telling everybody how to survive his system and get through it without coming up with blisters on their feet. Good advice. Jesus also gives us good, simple advice. And then in, in reading through this advice, he then comes to this question and says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I tell you to do? You see, it's easier for us to be impressed by a great, legendary basketball coach than a simple carpenter from Galilee. I mean, come on, what do carpenters know? The thing we learn from Jesus is that it takes work. It takes effort to dig a foundation, to make a, a, a life that's secure and strong, that won't be crushed by the waves of, of floods that come upon it, that won't be overwhelmed. And Jesus promises us something in this story. He says, if you will do these things, you will be strong in life and unshakable in storms. The first thing he says is, come. Come to Jesus. Come to me. True discipleship begins with simply coming to Jesus. I, I've uh, played this song before uh, by uh, Bob Dylan. You got to serve somebody. You got to serve somebody. And then he goes through a long list of those people whom uh, they, people will serve. The fact is, great crowds of, of Jesus' disciples came to him. They came from Jerusalem, Judea, the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. They came to hear him. They came to be healed of their diseases. They all came to Jesus. They heard about Jesus. They came to him. They wanted Jesus to do something in their life. They had this desire. They came because they had an expectation to meet with Jesus. They had this expectation that they would meet him, that he would impact them, that they would, cha that they would leave changed, different, transformed, better for their contact with Jesus. I wonder if in our own life that, that we had this expectation in coming to Jesus. You know, I, I, we need to be careful lest this whole Christianity thing becomes so much of a religion. It just becomes the, the things that we go through. I mean, when we came to church today, did we come with a certain expectation that I'm going to be confronted with the Word of God, that the Spirit of God will be here? Do we have this expectation that we would leave today a different person, something that God has spoken to us, something that He's meaning to change us, something that's going to influence our heart and make a difference in our life? Is there an expectation when coming to Jesus? That's why we say, and that's why I say, and that's why you should say, come to church. Come to church. Would you like to meet with Jesus? The church is the body of Christ. That's us. That's our meeting here. The body of Christ, we're meeting with Jesus and in his body. This is where the body of Christ meets. If you would meet with Jesus, you can approach him where his word is being preached. That's why day after day, week after week, we open up the word of God. May I say to you, there is no such thing as a disciple without a church. There are no churchless disciples. Disciples of Jesus Christ have a place and a community in which they are involved, in which they're meeting, in which they're joining together with him. That's why we say, come to church. So the first thing we see here is that we need to come to Jesus. But Jesus also says, hear. If you hear what I say, there's one thing to hear, but there's another thing to listen. Not everyone hears what Jesus says. It's not because he can't be heard. It's not because the speaker system wasn't working. It's not because he wasn't projecting. Today, many church attenders listen to God's Word the way they listen to a flight attendant 
on a, for frequent travelers. How many of you probably have the flight attendant safety spiel practically memorized? And as soon as the flight attendant begins, it begins uh, the, the, the dialogue, it's not a dialogue, the monologue, you just check out. So for many of us, it's, it's the same thing. We are the shades, we come into the church, the shades go down on our eyes, and uh, the, we, we, we check out our attention, uh, uh, we check out our attention, we just been there, done that, got that t-shirt, I'll get through to the end, when he says the amen, I'll go have my snacks and I've done my duty. So just because we're here doesn't mean that we're hearing. In our world today, you, you have to work to listen. There's words and, 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 and stimulus and media. It's, it's everywhere. We're bombarded by it. In fact, is we're so bombarded by it that everybody has these, these little electronic things they stick in their ears so we can always have some kind of stimulus on our brain. It's hard for us to find the silence that we need to hear the still, small voice of the Spirit of God that works in our life. Between TV, the Internet, the conversations, the iPod, the MP3 players, the sound bites, the video clips, our attention span just becomes shorter and shorter and shorter, and we just don't take the time and make the effort to listen to what God has to say. We're busy, always active. And so what we need to do is we need to stop and listen. We need to pause. We cannot listen to God's Word the same way we watch a movie with popcorn in one hand and a drink in the other hand, our feet propped up on the, and we just kind of, it's just there. It's just entertainment. It's very surface. Can't listen to God in that way. Can't understand God's Word that way. So my suggestion to you is this. Open up the Scripture. Follow along. And if you're here today, you can even make notes on the back and, uh, f and make the attempt to listen like it and to record those things that seem to stand out that God is speaking to you about. I would also suggest joining a small group or forming a small group and getting together with some friends for the purpose of, of discussing things that are coming up in your life, issues that you're dealing with, how I can be more disciplined, how I can have, have these spiritual disciplines make a difference in my life. Just making the effort to prolong into the discussion that we might learn and hear and that we would reflect and apply what is heard and learned. I haven't done it for a long time, but I remember when I first came to Grace Church, I remember standing at the back door at the basement, at the other basement, not nearly as nice as this basement. And, uh, and, and as people would go out, uh, we'd have the pleasantries, and, and they would say, nice sermon, Pastor. And I would say, what was it about? Do you remember? It was an embarrassing moment. But it, the problem, the thing was, it wasn't their fault. I'm the pastor. I'm trying to communicate. You see, just because I'm talking doesn't mean I'm communicating. There's a gap between me and you. It's my responsibility to bridge that gap. It's my responsibility to engage your mind. It's my responsibility to engage your heart so that not because these are my words, but because... God has opened up His Word, and He uses this mouthpiece to get His message across. So it's, it's important for me. I, I want to know, are you applying, are you uh, 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 reflecting on what you've heard? Or is it just, wow, pastor, great sermon, and Monday morning comes, and it's back to the same old, same old thing. It doesn't have any difference, and, and if it's just my words, that's fine. My words don't need to go any further than the walls of this room. But you know, if God says something in His Word and he, and, he says, and he says, why don't you hear me? Why don't you follow what I'm saying? Then why then are we not listening to what God is saying? The third thing that He says is this. After you come to Jesus, you hear what He has to say. Then action. Do it. Just do it. Three of the best words ever. Just do it. Stop with the complaining. 
Stop with the excuses. We too often look at what we cannot do and miss what we can do. Too often we're overcome with the impossibility of, the, uh, of what we think. And so we don't do anything. Here's what John Wooden said. Don't let what you cannot do interfere with what you can do. Maybe it's just a little bit. Maybe it's a little bit effort. Then take the little effort. Because it's in making those little efforts that we can see progress made. I would much rather see someone take a small little act, repeat it often until it's a part of their life, than try to, uh, then to be overwhelmed by some gigantic intentions that are never acted upon. Oh, you say, Pastor, I, I really want to be like Jesus Christ, but come on, He's God. How's that going to be? How can I ever be like Jesus? Start out small. Start out with a, a, a small habit of just getting to know him a little bit better, talking with him, communicating with him. How about just starting with a little bit of time, say 15 minutes, where you would sit quietly and let's, let his spirit speak to you. Doing something, acting upon what the Word of God says, requires time and effort. Time and effort. We will never be the people that God would like us to be if we will not make the time and, and if we will not take the time and make the effort. It's absolutely essential. So we have to be sure that we're going in the right direction for the right means. There's no shortcuts. As I was watching these, these um, uh, elite forces go through their testing, uh, it was amazing the things that the human body endures. But over and over again, when they were teaching this drill for these um, uh, special, forces, uh, special forces combat divers, they, the instructors stressed it. You must get this right. You must get it exactly right every time. Because the one time you get it wrong and you're underwater, you're dead. John Wooden has another famous quote. If you don't have time to do it right... When will you have time to do it over? Take the time, make the effort. The difference between action and no action is devastating. What do the scriptures tell us? Remember? The person who hears and does not do, the storm is going to come up, the flood is going to come, and the house will be destroyed, it will be ruined there will be nothing left. The difference between taking action and taking no action is absolutely horrific. Two houses were built. Two builders went out to build. Both experienced the storm. Both experienced the onslaught of water. One survives because one took the time to dig deep, to build a foundation on rock, to build the house up, so that when the, when the storms would come, they were prepared and ready. Last week I talked to you about Job. And this past week, I again have been in, in the book of Job and going slowly actually through that. Because when I think about what happened, the suddenness and the uh, incredible force that, that um, this test came upon Job, how could he have reacted that way if this was just a one-off event? And this is something the Bible tells us in, in Job chapter 1 that he would continually make these sacrifices. He was continually, uh, he had this practice of worshiping the Most High God. So when the day come, he was able to say, the Lord takes, the Lord, the Lord giveth, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He understood where his place was. The waters slammed against his house. The waters wanted to crush him, but he held firm and did not collapse. On New Year's Eve, a couple years ago, a young couple by the name of Andrea and Daniel Baskey, having expecting their first child, everything is ready. There's a sense of anticipation and excitement in the air, and just as the final pangs of birth sweep over the mother's body, the baby comes out dead. 
What a crushing blow. And yet this couple, because they had dug their deep foundation, they were founded on the rock of Jesus Christ, they withstood the flood, they withstood the onslaught of the water, slam, suddenly, ferociously, and completely unannounced, the waters just crashed around them. There's no time for preparation. No time to say, let's get ready. The foundation had already been built. The households, because foundations are deep. What a remarkable couple that is. About 50 years ago, a young missionary mother has just tucked her five children into bed before she herself retires and goes to bed. Later on that night, a police officer's loud knocking on the door wakes her up and gives her the news. Her husband has just been killed in a car accident. Suddenly, life changes. Unannounced. No time for preparation. The waters break like a wall. They rush against her house. It stands. The foundation is deep. Yes, she hurts but she's not crushed. Several years ago, I was preaching in a church in Virginia, telling that same story about my mother who just lost her husband. A young couple came up to me and introduced themselves as Scott and Janet Willis. Very soft-spoken. Very, uh, there was just something about them that, that caught my attention. I noticed that despite the long sleeves that she wore, her arms were scarred from a serious accident. They had loaded up six of their children, six of their nine children, into a van. They were leaving Chicago, heading north, going up to Wisconsin. As they were heading north on I-94, their van ran over a piece of metal in the road that pierced the gas tank, exploded, engulfed the entire van. They were barely able to get the van to the side of the road, and, and, and uh, Scott and Janet uh, f literally fell out. And as they turned around, they saw their six children completely engulfed in flames. Janet begins to cry out as the storm rages, no, no, no. Scott held her in his arms and he said, Janet, this is what we've been prepared for. Unannounced, no time. We don't often, we, we don't always see the storm building, suddenly the waters slam against our life. It's sudden, it's ferocious, and it wants to crush us. But Jesus says, if you'll come to me, if you'll hear my words and you'll do them, you'll be like the one who digs deep and puts his foundation down into the rock. When the waters rise and when they slam against your house, it will not shake and unshakable faith. So I ask you today, and I, I ask myself constantly, what about you, Dave? How about you? I, I never, ever want to experience the things that these people have experienced. But I can't be sure. You see, we talk about this discipleship stuff. We talk about this spiritual discipline. We kind of squirm. We kind of fidget under the direction of Jesus and his, what his will is, we kind of worry, you know, maybe Jesus wants me to do something I don't want to do. How many of you have been in athletics and your coach told you to do something you didn't want to do? You did it because it was the right thing to do. You did it because it was preparing you, it was training you, it was getting you ready. How many of you, when you were in school, your professor, your teacher said, I want you to do this and you didn't want to do it, but you did it anyway? The only reason you did it is because if you didn't, you wouldn't get a good grade and your parents would get angry with you. But it was part of the preparation. It's part of getting ready. Oftentimes in life, we have to do things we don't want to do, and we do them because we know it's the best thing to do. We resist the requirements of time and effort needed to build spiritual strength, and yet we're quite willing to put as much time and effort into other parts of our life, into building a nest egg for our family, into, into building or, or giving ourselves a comfortable life, we'll put the time and the effort into that. 
But when it comes to spiritual strength and being hard body Christians, we love the comfort. We think we're entitled to it. We loll around in the shades of life, drinking the elixir of easy living. And folks, it is easy living. We're soft, comfortable, flabby Christians. We're not the disciples whom Jesus wants to conquer the world with. And listen, folks, it's not going to happen automatically. We need to decide that we're going to get into the fray. We're going to be prepared. We're going to do the workout. We're going to build up. We're going to, we're going to make the time and the effort that's needed to be the spiritual, to have the spiritual strength that God would give to us. So our Lord says to us clearly, make no mistake, the one who will hear and do what he says is like one who, deeps, who digs a deep foundation, a house that cannot be shaken. So I ask the question, are you willing to take the time to make the effort? Will you do what's needed to work out your salvation? We've been given this wonderful gift the gift of forgiveness of sin, the gift of the presence of Jesus Christ, the gift to be able to come into the presence of God Almighty. We've been given this gift of salvation, uh, something we couldn't work for, something we couldn't do. So what are we doing with this gift? Do we leave it sitting on the shelf, hoping someday, I intend to get to it? And yet the instructions are, work it out. Build it up. Build up your faith. That's why we need spiritual disciplines. I know as I, as I began this series, it, was, it wasn't, um, honestly, I wasn't all that excited about it because it's the whole discipline thing. I, I, just don't, <clears throat> I just don't do well with that. I don't like being told what to do. I like doing what I want to do, but that's the thing. When we have this desire in our heart to be the Christian, to be a spiritually strong person, to be someone that others might go to because they can, they can draw on our strength, it's those spiritual exercises that we purposefully practice, it's those spiritual disciplines that we put into our life that brings us closer to God, it strengthens us in a spiritual way that we might be able to help and to encourage and to uplift others who need such strength in their life. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? Why do we say Lord Jesus? Why do we come and we worship Him and we lift up our faces to Him and yet we make no effort to be strong in Him? Submit to Jesus Christ. Let Him be the Lord of your life. Submit to Jesus Christ. Let him be your coach. Let him direct you. you the thing is that I've learned, in fact, is, as I was looking back over the men who have made the largest impression in my life, two out of the three that, that really impacted me the most were my coaches, soccer coaches. Um, my high school coach was uh, Coach Holsinger, uh, Charles Holsinger. And uh, one thing that's always stayed with me, he said this, when we were playing the game, he said, gentlemen, never rest until you're in position. You may find yourself anywhere on the field, but if you're out of position, no resting till you're in position. Another, co my soccer coach in, at, in, in uh, college was a guy who helped me through some very difficult times. Stayed with me. Beyond the field, off the field, he was concerned about me as a person. Wanted to build me up. Submit to Jesus Christ. There's no one that's quite like him. Commit to being an avid follower of Jesus Christ. Commit to him being our spiritual coach. The whole idea of these spiritual disciplines, we're going to get into some specific disciplines, but I just want to encourage you that, you know, this isn't, this isn't something that um, uh, um, you go off into a monastery, lonely up on a mountain someplace, and and uh, you begin to flagellate your body and you starve yourself to death because you want to build the spiritual. No, we need to understand that there's, 
the, the, the spiritual disciplines are a part of having a whole life, a, a wholeness to life, a holiness in life. It's a part of uh, being concerned about our physical bodies and our emotional uh, um, well-being as well as our spiritual well-being. And I'm very concerned that we, as Grace Church, the body of Christ, that we be, I'm, I'm concerned that we become comfortable in what we're doing and who we are, and we just want to float right along. The reason it concerns me is we don't know when the storms will come. And as a pastor, I believe it's important for me to present the way and to present the way of Jesus Christ in preparing us that no matter what happens, no matter what storms would occur, we're ready. We're ready. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your concern, deep concern for us, that even as these disciples gathered around you and even as you began to teach them very simple truths, to teach them about how to love one another and how not to be so judgmental and how to be dependent upon you and, Lord, how to be uh, trees that bear fruit, all these things you were teaching your disciples. And then you turn to them and you ask them the question, why do you call me Lord? Lord, why do we call you Lord? Can we honestly look you in the face and say, you are my God? I bow before you. I humble myself before you. I submit completely to you. I want to hear your every word. I want to know what it is your intent is for my life. I want you, Lord Jesus, to, to teach me, show me. Let me go out and practice what it is you're teaching me, to practice over and over and over again until it becomes such a part of our life. It becomes a way of living for us that others may say, wow, you look like Jesus. If we're going to call ourselves by your name, I pray there be a desire in our heart to indeed look like you in our actions. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to do this. Um, whenever we let out of church early here, the teachers kind of get upset because they feel like they need to let their students out and they're not done with their classes yet. So if you could kind of just slide out and not make too much noise out here so they don't know that uh, we're getting done early. And um, I'd encourage you also that um, you would uh, be sure and meet someone you don't know, get to know their name and uh, let them know you appreciate their being here today. Um, and um, remember to pray for one another. And I'd also encourage you that during the week, you take some time to reflect on some of the things that we've been talking here the past few weeks. Uh, if you're here our, and our guest today, I'm sure glad you're here. I really appreciate your making the effort, taking the time to be a part of Grace Church today. And um, <clears throat> as you go out, uh, we have offering boxes at each of the doors and also in the hallway there. Um, and encourage you to remember to um, also support Grace Church with your tithes and offerings. Let's stand, please. <clears throat> We've come here today to worship God. We've come here today to lift up His name. Now we're going to go back out into the world, and we go as His messengers, as His representatives. Let's represent Him well. Father, we ask Your blessings now on the beginning of this week and all through this week. Bring us back again. We meet together, worship together, lift up your name. God's